As we begin today's show, I want to start as I have the last few programs on the issue of abortion, which is not the cheeriest of subjects, but it is an important, thorny, complicated issue. And it is front and center in our political debate because of this leak out of the Supreme Court. And that leak has touched off quite a firestorm on social media, within the news media, people in their everyday lives talking with one another. And I'm trying to at least contribute to that conversation in a way that is thoughtful and responsible and also advancing my pro-life beliefs in ways that will hopefully help persuade some people because I think ultimately this comes down to hearts and minds, persuasion, and yes, even some compromise, even on an issue where it's sometimes difficult to find compromises. It's not impossible. And I just briefly on the show yesterday responded to one of these arguments that I've seen a lot. It's sort of a snappy little slogan that people are posting on Instagram stories or what have you that I thought really is weak and belies pretty shallow thinking about the issue. And I mentioned it in passing on the show, and then I expanded on it later on last evening in a whole Twitter thread. And then I wrote about it today at townhall.com as well. So in case you missed it, just very briefly, what we hear is this talking point. If you oppose abortion, don't have one. And that seems kind of on its face, simple, easy to understand. They make the point. I think it is simplistic and, in fact, facile. Because the same type of argument would not apply and would not be accepted on a whole host of other issues, especially from a progressive standpoint. And I gave a few examples. If you oppose rape, don't commit one. If you oppose a war, don't enlist to fight in it. If you don't like AR-15s or weapons of war or whatever they're going to call them, don't buy an AR-15. Don't buy an assault rifle. If you don't like to smell cigarettes in a bar, don't smoke. If you want to limit carbon emissions, don't drive or don't fly. And you can see on each of those issues, no one would actually say, oh, well, if your personal preferences and your values are that rape is bad, the only thing you should do about that is just commit yourself to not raping someone else. Right. If you believe, like all of us, that rape is evil and should be illegal, the argument would be your bodily autonomy, your personal liberty does not allow you to violate someone else's bodily autonomy or personal liberty. You say, so, Guy, that's not the same thing, except actually the question is the same question. At what point does abortion violate someone else's rights? You have competing liberties here, the right of a woman to control her body and the right of another human being not to be killed. When that unborn child becomes a human being is a difficult question. When is that life worthy of legal protection? That is the heart of this whole debate. Some people say it should be conception. Some people say it should be birth. Most Americans, based on the polls, believe that it lies somewhere in between. Maybe after the heartbeat begins around six weeks, maybe 12 weeks, 20 weeks where the child starts to become viable outside of the mother and can feel pain, right? That is the discussion that we're having. And it's just not as simple as dismissing it as saying, well, if you don't like it, don't have one, right? People who would like to have heavily regulated laws on firearms, people who'd like to confiscate guns, outlaw certain guns, right? Reimpose an assault weapons ban, They wouldn't accept this answer like, oh, well, if you don't like those guns, then you shouldn't buy them. They'd say, except the existence of those guns disproportionately. This is their argument. I'm not endorsing it, but they would say it disproportionately impacts society. We have to do this for the greater good. 
It's not enough to say, I'm personally not going to buy that type of gun if you feel like those guns shouldn't be available to the general population for whatever reason. Right? The green people, Green New Deal, environmentalists, they go out of their way to say we need collective action to limit carbon emissions. It's not just individual choices being made. We have to do things broadly as a society, and the government has a role to play. People who might oppose a war that's being fought by their government, by their country. Right? Just because they're not going to go put on a uniform and volunteer to go fight in the war, that's not the limit of their opposition to the war. There are broader, wider implications. There are lives at stake. You don't say, okay, well, you just don't join the army and now sit down and be quiet. Right? It's not that simple. We wouldn't really believe that those are good or persuasive or strong arguments in other contexts. So the question, as I said, the fundamental question is, when does life begin? When is it worthy of being protected? At what stage of pregnancy? People have reasonable disagreements on that. And as I said, most Americans are kind of pro-life with a little bit of pro-choice. That's what the public opinion polls show. But it gets a lot more complicated. And I think that we have to have these discussions in a complex way. And sometimes the results or the compromises will be messy and unsatisfactory. I concede that. But I also think it's important to underscore that simply saying, oh, well, if you don't like it, just don't do it yourself. That doesn't really cut it on this issue or many other issues, as I've just illustrated. The other one that I want to deal with is something that I get all the time if I mention being pro-life or make arguments against abortion, particularly later in pregnancy, which I find particularly gruesome. I hear, and it's not just limited to me, all the time, oh, well, you're a man. You can never be pregnant. So sit down and shut up. This is for women to talk about. You shouldn't really have an opinion on this. Now, there's sort of a snarky joke to be made here because we just had a big fight and a big discussion on trans rights about whether men can, in fact, be pregnant. And a lot of people argue, yes, men can be pregnant, but for this debate, men should be quiet because they can't be pregnant. It does feel a little incoherent, but let's just set that off to the side. The issue here, the argument, if you can call it that, I'll be generous, is that if you cannot personally be pregnant and have to deal with, let's say, an unplanned pregnancy, as a man, your opinion is worthless or at least worth less than a woman's. And this is used as a silencing tactic to tell a bunch of pro-life people to pound sand and keep their mouths shut. Because you notice they never tell pro-choice men to be quiet on the issue. All right, pro-choice men, it's like, hey, you're an ally. Good for you. Please speak up. If you disagree and you're a dude, well, then that's a problem because you're a dude. All right, that's how the game is played. I don't think that that's intellectually rigorous or honest at all. But again, does this standard apply on other issues? For example, I'm openly gay. I'm on the LGBT spectrum. I'm G in that acronym. Married to a man. Same-sex marriage and a lot of these questions have been in the realm of public debate for a long time. Many straight people have opinions on LGBT rights in either direction. So the Obergefell decision, which legalized gay marriage across the country, created that right, that was authored, that decision in the Supreme Court was authored by a straight, white, cisgendered man, Justice Kennedy. Now, was he told to be quiet and keep his thoughts to himself because he's not LGBT? Or was he dealing with a constitutional question? A more recent decision, Bostock, that expanded LGBT rights was authored by Justice Neil Gorsuch, a Trump appointee. Another white, straight, cisgendered man. Should he not really weigh in on this stuff, on these critical constitutional questions because He's not personally affected by it because he's not LGBT. 
No, of course not. That's preposterous. If you're a straight person, let's just say you're a straight person who strongly and passionately supports LGBT rights and same-sex marriage. And there's a lot of people like that out there. Does your voice not matter in the debate? Am only I allowed to talk about it or people who are gay or queer or whatever? Are we the only ones who can talk about this or debate these things? No, because we're like, what, three to five percent of the entire population. These are issues that affect everyone in different ways, because I think a lot of the proponents of gay rights would say it's not just about individual people. It's about human rights and human dignity and fairness and equality. And that matters to everyone. That exact same argument can apply to abortion, where, yes, I, of course, understand that it's a women's rights issue in a lot of ways. And I think it's good for men talking about this issue to be self-aware about that and not have a big blind spot there. But also many pro-lifers are pro-life because they view it as a human rights issue, where at some point, whether it's conception or weeks later or months later, that life is a human life worthy of legal protection. Therefore, it is a human rights issue. Therefore, anyone is welcome to weigh in and comment on it and give their arguments and try to make their case and to just try to backhand an argument and dismiss it out of hand because of the sex of the person making it is very lazy and demagogic and is actually a way to avoid an actual discussion on the substance. Here's another example, taking it out of the LGBT realm. What about war? The overwhelming majority of people who are in active duty combat at the front lines in war, overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority of people who are wounded and killed in action in war are men. Doesn't mean that there are no women, but it's lopsided. It's mostly men and it's not really close. Would that mean if we were debating a controversial war in this country that the United States was fighting that a female senator, let's say, got up on the floor and gave a speech against the war for her various reasons about the conduct of the war, the righteousness of the war, et cetera. Would it be OK if people got up and said, OK, little lady, pat her on the head and say, have a seat. You and your lady parts aren't really that well represented on the front lines. So your opinion doesn't really matter very much. We'll take it into consideration, but it's sort of like, you know, 5 percent, 95 percent. We're just going to listen to the men. Of course not. That would be insulting and ridiculous. Because it's a matter of national and international import. A lot is at stake. Lives are at stake and things are being done. Policies are being carried out by our government. Everyone is welcome to weigh in on that debate. That's what we do in this country. If you're spending a lot of your time trying to disqualify people, uh, people from sharing their opinion and trying to boil it down to their race or their sex or whatever, I think that says a lot about you and your confidence in the actual arguments beyond all the identity stuff. If you have an argument to make on abortion, make it. Don't sit around telling other people that they shouldn't have an opinion and really aren't allowed to come down one way or another because they're in some other category. Let's have the discussion. Let's welcome people's perspectives on it. Let's weigh which arguments are good and which ones aren't which ones are persuasive and which ones aren't, and let's go through the messy process of crafting public policy. Let's not say, oh, you look a certain way, or you were born with this chromosome, or you have this genitalia, and therefore you be quiet, unless you agree with me. I think it's fundamentally, intellectually bankrupt to do that. So those are some of the ground rules that I like to lay out about the debate that we have on these issues, especially this one. And the prevalence of the two arguments that I just rebutted, I felt like required me to come here and respond to them because frequently you hear almost nothing but those two types of arguments. And I think they fail. Fundamentally, they fail on the merits. I'm late already. We got to go. 
taking our first break of today's program right back after this short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. It's The Guy Benson Show. 